Hello, Think Liberty listeners. I am AJ Olding. Uh, I am your host of the Tales from the Shire podcast. This is episode 20 of Tales from the Shire. Uh, it's supposed to be a weekly show, uh, and I've been doing this for about a year. So if you do some simple math, I have missed quite a few weeks along the way. Uh, I have been on a particularly long hiatus as I am running for U.S. Congress. Uh, so in that time, I have been failing to uh, put out content. Um, recently, I went on a uh, on Justin O'Donnell's uh, YouTube show. He uh, O'Donnell for Liberty. He just started up a, a brand new like uh, video cast series, video series that he's doing uh, for libertarianism, and um, he interviewed me uh, to talk about uh, my views on the USDA and their role in the dietary choices and the dietary suggestions of Americans. This was spurned by, uh, something that I had done at pork fest, uh, at pork fest, uh, this last year, uh, and every year they do something called uh, soapbox idol where people get up and they rant for three minutes about something that matters to them and they get judged by other people. And I gave mine about my own dietary and, uh, and uh, health issues throughout my life. And I talked about why I don't like the USDA. And so Justin O'Donnell and myself expand on that a little bit more on his show. And um, he was uh, kind enough to allow me to take the audio from that show and use it for a podcast today. So that's what I'm going to be sharing. This is from uh, several weeks ago, um, but it's, you know, it's going to be good content. And, um, uh, before that kicks off, I'm going to play my actual rant from Porkfest, uh, talking about why I dislike the USDA so much. And so, you know, enjoy that. Well, I'm, I'm happy to be back, guys. Uh, let's get into it. Episode 20. All right. So you just heard AJ there tell you that he wants to end the United States Department of Agriculture. AJ, thanks for joining us tonight. How are you? I'm doing really great right now. How are you doing? I'm not bad. So... Tell us a, a little bit about you. What prompted you to get up at Soapbox Idol this year? What was it that got you to stand on a literal soapbox to tell people you hate the USDA? Well, so I'm running for U.S. Congress, right? And one yep. of the biggest things that I really want to achieve out of that run is, uh, you know, what, what all of us want to achieve, which is a freer society, Uh but like, I think the like the biggest issue for libertarians always comes to like guns, war, uh, drugs, and things like that. And like everyone kind of has their own little pet issues that they really care about. And this one's probably mine. Um, Why is that? Why is this I'm, your pet issue? Right. So I'm someone who's been uh, most of my life, um, particularly when I got done with sports at the end of high school. Well, at the end of my freshman year of college. I've been pretty physically unhealthy. Um, I, and, 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 but like even before then, I, and we can go into it, but, but like as I got older and, and more, not as I got older, but like recently over the last 14 months or so, I've sort of come to the conclusion that a lot of the health problems that I had earlier in my life were caused by listening to, you know, dietary advice that was given to me by one person or another, or just eating food that um, my parents cooked for me and whatever else. I never really, you know, ate, you know, more fast food than anyone else. I wasn't less active than anyone else as a kid, but I had a lot of problems. And uh, it, it turns out that I just don't do very well with the standard American diet. And I think a lot of people don't do very well with the standard American diet. Um, and we can start to get into details. If you, you know. Well, I, I mean, I, I can get that. I can emphasize with that. I mean, I'm a bigger guy, uh, but even when I was at my most fit, when I was running marathons, I was running 10 miles a day uh, when I was in the army. And when I was in college, I was still eating a large pizza a day and McDonald's every night when I was out partying and drinking till I couldn't stand anymore. Um, mm -hmm. but like, I was always under the assumption everyone had always told me is like, well, you're in as good a shape as you are. Cause you run 10 miles a day. It's not it's like you're eating shit food, but you're overcoming with what you're doing. 
Yeah, right. So, but that's, I mean, it's funny that you bring that up the, about yeah. the running thing because there actually are a lot of, um, there actually are a lot of like unhealthy looking runners out there. And, you know, and, and, and a lot of it has to do with like all the foods that runners are told to get into. And, and we're getting further into the weeds before we even build the, build the background on this. Right. But a lot of that I think has to do with, with a lot of the foods that runners are told to eat these high carb foods have insanely high glycemic indexes. And so um, their body stores fat, even though they're using just insane amounts of energy. So a lot of times when you see like a runner who's going along, uh, they'll be handed some type of like sugar packet or sugar drink or something like that to kind of suck that down because they actually yep. physically need the energy right there. We used to and call it, it goo. Matter. Yeah, and it doesn't even matter uh, how fat they may or may not be. A lot, m- most of them are skinny, but you will run across occasionally a fat runner, and you're just like, well, that's that's why because they're following the advice to a T. Uh, just all the time. Right. Um, now, again, I, I talked about my love of soapbox idolists, one of my favorite things every year at Porkfest. Um, your rant was exceptional at soapbox idol. One could argue that I believe you won soapbox idol, except for the fact that Tom Woods didn't understand the rules on how to judge. No, Tom, gave five. Tom, Tom gave me a perfect score. Um, they, they edited that. Um, no, it, was, it was still pretty, uh, pretty biased judgment. Uh, it and was, the, ju- it the judges. Tom, Tom, Tom gave it. I got the highest score that Tom gave to anybody. So right. um, let's recap that rant. I mean, let's yeah, tell okay. everyone here what you told us at Porkfest. Yeah. With a three minute timer. Go. Right. Okay. So, <laughs> so essentially what I did at Porkfest was I just started to talk through a whole bunch of health issues that I've had going back to, to when I was a kid, um, really like in third or fourth grade, I got picked on quite a bit and everyone gets picked on great kids are mean but i got picked on quite a bit because i would fart more than everyone else in the class and i wasn't popular obviously because of that there were times i i have specific memories as a kid of when someone next to me would fart and people would yell at me like the entire class because that's just how often it would happen um you know you progress a little further on uh into into life, you get to you get to start it in puberty, and I had terrible acne, and and a lot of people have terrible acne. This is not, you know, all that different of a. Uh, this is nothing new. A lot of people deal with this. I, acne my, care, I think, is one of the biggest industries in advertised over the counter medicine. Oh yeah, isn't it? And, so. and we, we can actually get into some, some ways to to help to help with that later on, um, and. And like even today, I have pockmarks on my cheeks um, from when I was 13, 14, 15 years old um, because it was so bad. I remember times in high school where like I'm just sitting in class and I'll just start bleeding from my face. And it's very hard to have any type of self to have any type of confidence in yourself um, going forward and and, and whatever else. Um, And. And I also struggled with weight, and obviously there's a there's a consumption part of that. I understand that I ate more than most people probably should. When I was in high school, I played football at around 230 pounds in high school, and I would uh, drop down to about 185 every year for wrestling, and that would be like this massive extreme drop. And between between the next football between the end of wrestling season and the next football season, I would add that that 40 pounds back on. And it wasn't even like something I had to try to do. It was just the way I naturally ate. And that probably should have been a big indicator to me at that point in time. That like, Hey, when your football or what, even when your wrestling career gets over, like you can't, you can't do one of these without the other right now. Right. Um, and it's a big problem. Um, you know, I, I remember between freshman year of high, of, of, of high school and sophomore year of high school, I went to my doctor and I was, I think 30 pounds heavier than the time that she saw me between freshman and sophomore year. And she said, I'm really not happy about this. I'm like, well, that's not even the half of it. <laughs> I actually gained 80 pounds and lost 50 in that amount of time. And she just like, are you kidding me? Cause I, I came into high school about 160 pounds, got up to 230. Okay. I, I mean, 
I was going to say, I, I feel like gaining 30 pounds between freshman and sophomore year of high school shouldn't really be that unnormal. That's about shouldn't the time be. most kids hit their growth spurt. Shouldn't be, right? Um, but, but so, I mean, this is all, so far it's all pretty team stuff. But um, uh, after that, that time, towards the end of my high school, towards the end of my time in high school and then going into college, I developed, I started to develop I guess I'm still not 100 percent sure if it's correct to call them mouth ulcers or like uh, internal cold sores, and I, you know, I don't have any type of diseases that would cause that, but I would get them from time to time, and it would be painful enough that I would struggle to sit still because, like, a tip, like some, like some sore on the tip of my tongue would like accidentally nick against a tooth, and it wasn't even like I bit it or anything like that. It would just be like, oh, all of a sudden, now I have this insane amount of pain. And after dealing with this for, and there were times where this was so bad, like I had, I had difficulty sleeping. And after years of dealing with this, a dentist finally suggested to me like, hey, I think that you're just, that you just have an aversion to acidity in your food. And I'm like, okay. So that, that makes sense. And, and it works a little bit. It worked a little bit uh, at one point in time to like cut back on, on tomatoes and things like that. Um, and then when I get to college, I come to find out that, uh, that I have, um, there, there was a point in time in college where I, I actually was doing an all nighter and I crapped my pants just 18 or 19 years old. I was at the time. And, uh, you know, and, and around this same period of time, like I, I kind of knew it was going to come at some point in time because I, I was having such a hard time controlling any of the way, <laughs> um, that I, that I, yeah, I had such a hard time literally just controlling my bowels, uh, that, that like I would have to run to the bathroom multiple times a day, not even the poop, just, just to wipe, just have that. That leak, and so many people have leaky gut and other things like that today that I talk to. It's 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 wild how pervasive that that is, but how much more pervasive this issue is than it sounds. But because it sounds horrible, and I get diagnosed with with IBS, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, which is not like a really a disease. It's kind of a placeholder that doctors have where it's like, okay, well, you have some kind of inflammatory cause in your gut, and something about the way you're eating is causing this issue. Um, and so he recommends to me to cut back on leafy greens and to cut back on caffeine. And that works pretty well, but I also medicate that issue never really went away. Um, but so I, 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 and, and eventually I found out that, uh, the IBS was linked to, um, one of the acne medications that I took when I was in high school, which actually did clear up everything. And then, you know, a year <laughs> after I get diagnosed with IBS, the, I start seeing the advertisements on television. Like, did you take Accutane at one point in time? You're entitled to like $100 or something. Did you get like a check? I, so, <laughs> so here's how naive and dumb I was at the time. Um, when I got on that medication, I had to sign away so many things. Like they wouldn't just let you on it. Um, they, like they would not just let you on this medication. You have to, um, there, there were multiple waivers that I had to sign, which no 16 or 17 year old, whatever it was at the time should be allowed to sign up for. Now, how um, did the FDA go ahead and approve a drug that they know you're going to have to sign away your rights for restitution yeah, if something so, goes wrong. So I, don't, with I don't mind that, but like, but so the reasoning that I that I did for not going after the company and, and, and joining this class action lawsuit was I was like, they could have easily thrown that on there, and I wouldn't have noticed. Like, I, I, in my mind, I was I was naive enough to be like, well, they tested it, they warned me, and so I I don't. I don't think I have a right to take this money from them, even if the government says uh, I do. This was, this was sort of like an early version of libertarianism in my mind. Um, <laughs> you kind of see the wheels spinning from a libertarian perspective, but like at the same time, that's really naive to assume like the that the, the pharmaceutical companies are like good nature, right? Um, 
and I, and I, but I just made that assumption. Um, and so I didn't go after them. Uh, whatever. I, I have money now. I don't, I don't need the money from that. Um, but so I don't, so I eventually got over the issue of the acne, right? Because of medications, but, yep. but I was still dealing with flatulence, IBS, like literally having to go to the bathroom multiple times a day just to wipe. And these mouth, mouth sores, and they were better than they were at their worst, but I still had to deal with these up until, you know, um, uh, you know, up until the time I was about 27 years old. And I showed a court fest last year in 2019, having also, you know, something something else I'm obviously struggling with is, is my weight. I, it, you know, I'm over 300 pounds right now. I was over 340 pounds last summer. Um, um, so I, I remember this. I was there for a bit of it. You had a revelation at Porkfest last year. Some stuff yeah. happened. We had some conversations with people. Uh, we, we left Porkfest, and you made a decision to try something radical and crazy, yes. and I mocked you for it for a year. Um but in the end, I mean, it, it worked out for you. I, uh, oh, above my really teasing well. and above our friends kind of yeah. mocking you. <laughs> it, was, it was literally just, I'm walking around one day at Porkfest and one person suggests to me, why don't you just try this carnivore diet? Because I, I was complaining about weight loss specifically. I wasn't complaining about these other issues because I had tried Weight Watchers for like three years off and on. I had tried uh, various methods of like trying to cut down how much um, – meat I was consuming and, and other things like that. Um, but it, yeah. And so I got on that and I went and I lost like, I lost like 20 pounds in the first month and a half being on that. And I didn't even like notice any of the other, um, anything else. And it was, it was maybe like a couple months in that, that I realized like, I'm not having to go to the bathroom all that often. And then another couple of months after that, I started to think like, Oh, the ulcers in my mouth are gone. Like, and then a couple of months after that, I was like, Hmm, my joints feel a lot better than they have in years. And some of that is obviously weight loss, but like a big portion of that can be attributed to, um, just like an increased amount of collagen in the diet, right. Where, where it's like right. your soft tissue is, is just helped out so much. And so, so what I did was literally stop eating plants, um, all plant products. I just stopped eating them. And I don't believe that this is like the correct diet for everyone. I don't believe this is like the ideal diet for everyone, but something that I've come across in the last 14 months of just like digging through nutritional research constantly is, is how much basically everybody fails with the standard American diet with what they're told to do by the USDA. Um, and, and that brings us to your rent. That, that really brings us right. to like full circle, a year's journey. Uh, you, you got a lot happier and healthier over the course of the year doing what you were doing. Um, and again, us being the assholes that we are in your friends group, we mocked you all the time. We always made fun of you for your diet because it was, hey, Presto Pasta's got a new monthly special. It is amazing. And you're like, I'll get the sausages again. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll get the meatballs again. And it's like, are you, man, this, the heat is amazing. You should try it. Um, yeah. But in reality, I mean, you did what was good for you. You did what worked for you. And, and, and the thing is, I'm also not not going to sit here and tell everyone, like, oh, I have everything figured out. Because, like, where I am in life is still not perfect as far as my health goes. I I kind of fell off everything towards the holidays last year and never really got back on it uh, until Port Fest again this year. So in the last 14 months, basically, I lost 60 pounds and then the holidays hit, and then COVID hit, and I gained about 40 of that back, and now I've lost about 15 again. But the thing is, like, I can say, I, you can lose weight on any diet. That is, right. um, calories in, calories out is not a perfect model, but it's essentially correct. Um, uh, or, or close enough to correct that, you know, uh, we, can, we, can, we can reasonably say you can lose weight on, on any diet by just restricting calories enough. Um 
So that's not the real thing. But the thing is, like the second I get, I, I lose these things, I realize like, oh, I'm I'm less healthy, and I'm having I'm having a harder time with all the other issues I described. Um, yeah. So I, I, and that brings us full circle. That brings us back to Porcus this year. You got up, you gave your rant. Ties into the USDA. I, I, I mean, how is it their fault? How is it their responsibility? Oh, you asked me do? for why, why I gave the rant, though. Okay, and I never oh, really yeah. answered that question. Yeah. So I had, I had planned a couple other rants. <laughs> Neither of, none of them, none of the other two rants that I had planned and uh, actually were of anything that was, that was important and they wouldn't have scored well. But, like, it's not about that for me anyway. It was, it's always about having fun. And then this, and then the, the one rant I had plans about, um, well, one of them was kind of X-rated, so we're not going to talk about that. And the other one was like about my being upset that uh, the Dodge Charger still has a Daytona version, even though they don't run a NASCAR anymore. And that was going to be like the rant I was going to go with. And it's, it's, it's pretty funny. I worked on it. Um, but then I think you would have had a very smaller audience appreciation. Oh yeah, I would have had a very small audience for that one. But then, but then it just kind of came up where it was like, I don't know. It it was had very similar revelations to what I had the year before, and I was realizing like, oh, you're falling back off of things. You need to get back on it, and you're. And, and there were so many other people who talked. There's so many people at Porkfest that talk about their diets. Um, there's so many people in the community in New Hampshire, like the like the overall free day project that have in, like insane wild diets. And I realize mine is one of the most insane. Um, so I mean, but, uh, what it, what is you bringing up there? I mean, that's a fantastic point. That's something I want to drive home. So I mean, I, I feel like it's time for a non non sponsor pitch right here. Somebody who's not paying us to tell you how great they are. If you've never been to Porkfest before, come to Porkfest in 2021 um it'll be in the summer up at rogers campground in lancaster new hampshire you're gonna have some of the best food you've ever had in your life because it's not in a restaurant it's people it's their passion um it's what they do and at one campsite you'll have somebody making a vegan cuisine that's absolutely insatiating and like you cannot fathom how good vegetables could be Oh yeah, and two sites two sites over, you have somebody who's just grilling up high end steaks on an open flame, um, and, and this is all stuff done on a community basis in the community level, and it's something that we've really grown to appreciate in our small community here in New Hampshire is the number of great cooks and the diversity of the foods and the diets and the cooks, um, and the fact that we have people like AJ and. Um, the other people who embrace carnivore and the keto cult, as I call them, and then the uh, vegan campaign and all the kids. Right, it, it, and it's fascinating because everyone's improving, everyone's getting healthier, but nobody's doing the same thing. And I think you touched on that a lot in your rant about the USDA, that it was the top-down approach and the one-size-fits-all right. approach that ruined everything. So that's that's ultimately like one of the biggest things that I try to have people understand when it comes to diet, I have people all the time, all the time, ask me for dietary advice, and I hate <laughs> giving because I'm so worried that I'm going to tell someone to do something, and they're going to do it, and they're going to have some type of negative reaction to it. And, I, and the other thing is, like, I am not an expert. I research. All my research has been based on how do I make myself healthier. It's not been based on, like, how do I make the world healthier. But, like, the biggest thing that I concluded from all of this is, like, the concept of an optimal human diet or an ideal human diet is so unbelievably not a real thing. Um, because everyone everyone deals differently in, like, how their body processes the food that come in, digests the different food that comes in. Um, you know, one of the biggest problems that I suffered from when it came to the acne or the sores in my mouth or like different joint pains and things like that, and even the GI stuff was it's it's inflammation that's caused by that, that that was coming up because of the diet I was eating, and I and like I can easily say like oh it's plants and cutting out all the plants has made me maybe healthier, but there may be things I can add back in. I'm I'm toying around with the idea of adding avocado back in and cutting out dairy because I, I feel like dairy's hurting the weight loss. And avocado is not a very high toxicity plant where a lot of others are. Um, so 
you know, it, it's not, like, I'm not looking to be dogmatic about anything either. Um, and yeah, so I'm, I'm very worried that when people ask me for, for dietary advice, I'm going to give them bad advice. So the, the thing that I try to always tell people is like, the most important part of your nutritional journey and whatever else is that you're doing research and figuring out how to do things for yourself. I think elimination diets are one of the best ways to start. And, and there's a bunch of different elimination diets out there. Obviously, carnivore is a very extreme version, but veganism is an elimination diet or well, whole food plant-based is what I prefer to call it because veganism is an ethical choice and whole food plant-based is a dietary choice. Um, <laughs> we, we can get into mocking vegans at another time. <laughs> I don't mock them. I really don't. Um, and then, and then there's like a bunch of people do whole 30 in the community. And I don't, I'm not overly knowledgeable about whole 30, but the entire concept is like cutting down on what the, the, the people who came up with it perceive as like high toxicity foods and then adding stuff back in to see how you do well with and like my, my advice is to start an elimination diet and just do research from there to see how you feel and all that other stuff. Like that is, that's my advice. People come to me and they're like, should I be drinking diet soda? Like I have, no, <laughs> no. Like, I, I mean, no. that, that really brings it back to the root of the issue though, is like, People are seeing you have success. People is like you, you, the weight you've lost has been noticeable for those of us who know you in real life. Um, you're definitely seem like happier and more upbeat about your diet. And you got a little bit of like an evangelist there about it for a while. For a um, so is it really a surprise that people are coming to ask you for help when you're showing really positive results and you're really positive about what's going on? And the other alternative is the food pyramid. The top-down yeah. approach to one-size-fits-all would never work for anyone. Right. And, and that's the other thing is, like, it doesn't always never work for anyone. Like, there are healthy people. I mean, I don't believe that there are many healthy people eating a standard American diet, but there are some. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so, I mean, do, do we want to dive into a little bit of the history of the USDA and the food pyramid? On so, you, I mean... I feel like you were the one who got cut off by Carla Garrick at that five minute when you were two minutes over your three minute timer. I kind of want to know where you were going. Um, well, so I was going exactly with where I was. Um, I maybe had a couple more one liners that I could throw in, but like I got in the points that I knew I could. And it was supposed to be three minutes. My speech ended up being four and a half. And like I even I even saw the timer beforehand, and I was like, okay, please don't yell out when I have ten seconds left. Just put your hand up, and when that happens, I'll just ignore. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but everyone but um, how did that food pyramid come to be? Uh, how, how did so, the United States government, uh, the, whose sole responsibility is the protection of life, liberty, and property, and uh, the administration of the post office and interstate commerce, when did they get in their idea to tell people what to eat? So, so the food pyramid came about, uh, the USDA came about in the 90s, around the 1970s. And um, it was largely based off of something called, what was it, the McGovern Report, I think it was called? Yeah, the McGovern Report. And um, George McGovern was, at the time, a U.S. senator from the state of South Dakota. And he uh, wanted to issue out warnings to the American people about what they should and shouldn't be eating. Um, the 20th century was sort of a downturn uh, for chronic illnesses. While we were able to treat more and more diseases and extend life, we started to see more and more people with obesity, with Alzheimer's, uh, with diabetes, things like that. And so this senator really wanted to send out some kind of dietary report uh, to say what was and was not true. And it was very hotly debated. And at one point in time, you can find the film. This isn't an exact quote, but he, he said something along the lines of senators don't have time to wait for all of the data to come in like you scientists do before you make decisions. And so he was just like, I'm going to take whatever information is available and just say that that's the dietary guidelines. Um, and so George McGovern, I, I believe he ate – a dash diet at the time, I might be wrong about that. And the da and the dash diet is a hard, it's a high carb, low fat diet. It's very similar to the standard American diet. He had uh, a staffer working for him. I do I do not recall the staffer's name off the top of my head. But the staffer was a vegetarian, 
And after listening to um, a whole bunch of different doctors come in and give their reports on where they saw um, nutrition in the world, and, and all of it was conflicting, by the way. Um, like all these doctors and nutritionists came in and all gave conflicting reports in the 1970s. And George McGovern and his vegan staffer, or sorry, vegetarian staffer, just went and, you know, wrote down what they thought nutrition was supposed to be. And then uh, a couple of years later, um, a woman named Carol Tucker Foreman, uh, as part, part of the USDA, uh, came in, I believe she was like the deputy head of the USDA at the time, comes in, takes the McGovern report, and writes up the food pyramid. She even consulted with some doctors who told her, no, the McGovern report, you know, yes, do not use it. Um, but she, she based the food pyramid ar- around that. And the thing is, the food pyramid has been very hard to get rid of and very hard to combat in that amount of time. Um, and it hasn't changed a whole lot. I understand it's not a pyramid anymore. It's like on my plate or whatever it is. But the, di- the actual dietary guidelines have not changed a whole lot. It's still like roughly 10 servings of carbohydrate. It's still like roughly five servings of fruits and vegetables. It's still, you know, minimal amount of fat, minimal amount of protein, minimal amount of refined cane sugar. I, I agree with the last one. Um, and it's, it stayed roughly the same through that time. And, and one of the biggest things that stands in the way of it changing has been uh, the USDA, just like many parts of the government, is not about actual human health. There's so many corporate interests. Um, and people can say, like, oh, the dairy industry is massive and the beef industry is massive. But, like, if you really look at, like, dollars to donuts, like... Sugar. The, the sugar industry... The processed food industry. I'm not even. Gonna, I'm not gonna like go after like whole food plant chicks. Again, they're not the problem. It is. It is the processed food industries are so hardly driving the production of corn and wheat and soy that, like, if the USDA changed what they said, like people would change their diet so radically overnight that we would almost have to overnight redo our farm system in this country. Um, and, and it's a really scary proposition, but the fact of the matter is the way we do things today makes people unhealthy, so it's not a good idea to necessarily keep it how it is just for the sake of these special interest industries, right? Um, so so what is the answer then? Uh, I mean, is the answer a new food pyramid? Is, is it study to tell people what kind of a is, – is the answer to put out some kind of recommended baseline for people to work I, off of? I don't, believe, I don't believe that there should be any recommended baseline. Okay. Because at some point in time, if that baseline is found to be wrong, corporate interests will fight back against it changing. Um, there have been people who have quit their jobs at the USDA saying that they're not allowed to tell people to stop eating certain foods. Like they're told that because it would ruin some industry. Um, and, that's, and that's a major problem. Um, yeah. I so, mean, so is, that, is that a problem with any government interference, though? I mean, I mean how, how are we going to overcome? If there is no government baseline, if there's no government put out baseline, um, what's to stop? let's say the American Heart Association is putting out their baseline for healthy heart eating. And if that's proven wrong, all of a sudden it's not just corporate interest, it's non-profit interest. Completely bunk. Uh, The American Heart Association, uh, the American Heart Association's Heart Healthy logo is on Cocoa Puffs. Uh, we all know the things can be bought. The Better Business Bureau sells ratings. Um, Right. But Right, so like, but ultimately the thing is, like, we can ask, like, what's the better system for telling people how to eat? And the thing is, we were healthier prior to the USDA's existence. Okay. Uh-huh. Well, well, the brass tax of it, the 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 fundamental breakdown, um, where we need to get to, what what the whole crux of this is. You're running for Congress. <laughs> what is the role of the United States government here, and how do you address it as a congressman? See, I would. Ultimately, like you have to find people to go along with you, with you on this, but like I would like to pass legislation to get rid of the USDA entirely. Um, maybe spin off the fourth system uh, because 
You know, if you all, if you, if you just, if you ended the USDA tomorrow, like, yes, there would have to be a whole bunch of private industries, like reorganizing the way they do their farms and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, the forest system is a little more difficult. And the reason I bring up the forest system is that it is under the USDA. So dissolving that is a much more complicated process. So, you know, some type of legislation that splits the forest system from the USDA, maybe hands the forest system over to the National Parks Department because, like... So it's, makes- not, it's, it's not as simple as a three-line piece of legislation that says the United States Department of Agriculture shall cease to operate and exist on December 31st, 2022. See, if that was on my, if that was in front of me, I would vote yes on that. Uh, the forest okay. system... <laughs> um, so it would be... I'm going to add another line, like, Forest or the, the National Parks Department now runs the Forest Service. Like that would be that that would I'd add a fourth line, and it would be that. Okay, uh, and I mean, in reality, has there has there been any good that's come out of the USDA and what they've done? Is there is there any kind of positive upside that would be losing by getting rid of that government agency? If, if there has been a positive outcome from having the United States Department of Agriculture, I do not know what it is. Um, well, there is some stability in uh, food pricing when it comes to farmers, but that's also such that the government is subsidizing it in ways that real market incentives don't ever get to these farmers. Yep. They're just growing what the government tells them that the government will buy from them. Um, so no, not really. Like there, there's that problem that you have to overcome, but that's not a positive. That is, um, that is an effect of the market that has to be overcome when we get rid of it. It's not, yeah. Uh, Well, uh, again, you guys have heard it. I mean, a little bit more in depth in the five minutes we got at Pork Fest. Uh, a little bit more in depth in the four and a half minutes you got on YouTube and Facebook Live from AJ. But that is that we need to get rid of the United States Department of Agriculture, and that's just one of many. Um, mm-hmm. And again, AJ, this is his pet issue. This is his libertarian moment to shine and tell people why the government sucks with something that he knows the most about, because he has literally put thousands of hours into figuring this out for himself, and I've sat there and watched him. Um, AJ, how can people get involved in your campaign? You know what? Contact me on Twitter and we'll figure out how to make that happen. I'm still, I, this is my first time running for office and I'm still okay. trying to figure out how to run a campaign. Um, what I've been telling everybody is to go help Justin O'Donnell with his campaign because I'm going to be latching on to his campaign for a lot of my campaign stuff um, because I'm still trying to figure this out myself. Uh, that's uh, the way to do it. This is it's 2020. It's the year of COVID. It's something new. It's something fun. My team, what we're doing is trying to put together an idea of how to have some new events to push the boundaries of the safer at home orders in a complete and utterly safe way. AJ is going to be there with us. I know we have a farmer's market coming up in a couple of weeks. His Twitter handle at Andrew Olding scrolling on the bottom right now. Make sure you follow him on Twitter. Um, hit him up there. AJ is very active on Twitter. He will respond to you. He will engage with you. And he will argue with you if you push him and you really want that argument. I've seen it happen. Um, other ways, make sure you look at the Jorgensen campaign, Joe20.com. That's where we're going to be latching on. We're going to be doing that as well since I'm running for the United States Senate. Again, this is the O'Donnell for Liberty show. This is our campaign show. This is us pushing forward and helping to get the word out about libertarian candidates here in New Hampshire. We're going to be working as proxies. We're going to be helping Joe Jorgensen push that threshold and bring the libertarian message to every voter in New Hampshire this year as well. You want more information on my campaign? Again, you can visit O'Donnell2020.com. Two big gold buttons right on the front page. Donate, volunteer. Both of them are really important. If you're out of state, you can't volunteer. You can't get on the ground for us, but you want to help financially contribute. The New Libertarian Party of New Hampshire just spent $15,000 on a ballot access drive. Now, what does that mean? It means me, AJ, Zach, Daryl, we're all going to be on the ballot this year. Everyone in New Hampshire is going to have the chance to vote for us, but it costs a lot of money. And we got a lot more to do to get there. If you want to wear your support, again, snackswag.com, and I'm going to bring it up right here. You can go see what we have here. We've got merch for AJ. We've got merch for me, and we got merch for Joe. 
This is our official merch store from the campaigns. You can look it up. AJ's got this awesome logo. Uh, the old thing for Congress appeal to heaven. If you're not familiar with the pine tree revolt in New Hampshire, it's something you might want to look into, but this is a, the deep cuts of political logos here with what AJ, AJ is putting out, but it's available in any color you want. Uh, just go to snackswag.com. Uh, red one is the most flavorful. Red, red one's the best. Red one's my personal favorite myself. Um, but we do have a full suite of election merchandise that you can order on snackswag.com, uh, including sweatshirts, face masks, beach towels, uh, and T-shirts for O'Donnell for Senate, Joe Jorgensen 2020, and Andrew Olden for U.S. Congress. Um, now, before we part, Andrew, any final thoughts? Anything you want to pitch? Yeah, I got, I got one final thing I want to say that's another way the USDA has screwed over uh, <laughs> everything um, that is not, you know, what I've already covered and it's not diet specific. Like I said before, I mentioned it before, the Forest Service is also under the USDA. The Forest Service has been, I don't know about nationwide, but at least in New Hampshire, has been closing down several trailheads. The trailheads they're choosing, I cannot for the life of me figure out what their motivation is. Specifically, um, I, I can tell you for a fact the closing of the Crawford Connector is only going to make it so that there are more people on the Crawford Path which means because that because that trail is owned by New Hampshire and part of their state and for their uh, state parks department, and so it's just the closings are very obviously done in such a way that it's going to result in more people on trails and more transmissions of COVID. That I don't understand what's going on. Like, so you're saying the government is not efficient or straightforward or making sense yeah, in, it, in the arbitrary it, it, shit they're doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And if I can make one more comment on the whole yep. COVID thing, we're seeing today, uh, while this COVID thing is happening, happening, that obviously people with comorbidities are having a harder time dealing with COVID. If you're eating healthier, you're going to have a, less, a lesser chance of having a comorbidity. Since the USA came out with their dietary guidelines and some people actually followed those dietary guidelines, we've only gotten bigger and fatter as a community. Which is only going to result in more COVID deaths. So without the, so I, I, I you know, more COVID I, deaths or more deaths in general. I feel like that's just a generally good concept. Um, oh yeah. You, you argued me and you had a hypothetical theoretical argument where neither of us are doctors when you kept bringing up the data points that people with higher levels of vitamin D were having showing up less than active COVID cases. And I said, well, that's just because they're outside and they're active. They're just healthier people. So. There, there's a massive correlation between vitamin D and showing up in, um, in hospitals right now. Um, the only reason that I don't think it's just people going outside is that not everyone collects vitamin D at the same rate. And you don't see anyone at those higher thresholds. So I think e- you don't see anyone in the hospitals at those higher thresholds of vitamin D. So I think even the people who are sitting at home just supplementing are, are even better off than the people who are not. And maybe I'm wrong. But that's just what the data seems to point to to me. Um, we live far enough north that it's very difficult for us to get an ancestrally consistent amount of vitamin D. And now I'm getting super into weeds about nutrition. <laughs> that I, I really recommend that anyone who lives as far north as, as you and I do, or we live in southern New Hampshire, like should probably be supplementing vitamin D all the time. And I think especially during COVID. But who knows? Ivor Cummins has talked a lot about this. He's a nutritionist from South Africa. Um, it's, it's very easy to find his work on this issue. All right. Well, AJ, thank you for joining us tonight. Okay. Uh, it was a pleasure to hear you. Pleasure to have you expand upon that rant as always. Thank you all for listening to episode 20 of Tales from the Shire. I want to thank Justin O'Donnell again for letting me use the audio from his show uh, where he interviewed me. Uh, so, you know, a little bit different than what we usually do here. Um, as always, please uh, share this with all your friends and family uh, on all the different social medias. You can find uh, this podcast and, and others like it at think-liberty.com and anywhere else where there are podcasts. If you just search Think Liberty, you will find us. You can also find us on all the different forms of social media. And uh, this show uh, itself has a um, has a Facebook page. If you just search out Tales from the Shire, I should probably be a little bit more active on that. But 
anyway, uh, hopefully I, uh, I am able to put out content a little quicker. Um, the campaigns are obviously going to be ending here in the next couple weeks. And so I, I, I will be running out of excuses, uh, to not be more regular with this in the future. Uh, thank you all for listening. As always, uh, I have been your host, AJ Holding. <laughs>